December 21, 2012. The end date of the sophisticated long count calendar created by the ancient Maya in Central America. Countless books and websites, magazine articles and newspaper headlines debate its meaning. With enthusiasts in two camps, those forecasting apocalypse, the end of time, and those who see a coming renewal, a rebirth of consciousness. Adding fuel to the debate, some scientists see the increasing number of natural disasters in recent years as evidence of a catastrophic climax of events in 2012. How much of what we're hearing is science? And how much is superstition? In this film, leading researchers, writers and scientists in the field tell us exactly what this date means to them, why it's important, and what we should expect. The December 21st, 2012 date is gaining ground in the popular media, and there is a lot of apocalyptic hype around it. But it, uh, it's sort of an indication that one is not looking deep enough into the phenomenon. One of the great challenges uh, that poses us is uh, this question of uh, um, 2012. Uh, what does this mean to us? There are texts and traditions coming down to us from, from, from the Maya which suggest this is not just the end of a calendrical epoch. Uh, but the end of an entire age of the of the earth and of and, and, and of everything that has been built and accumulated in the last five thousand years, that this too will come to an end. If that were the only thing I knew, that it was a consistent ancient prophecy, I would note it. I might shudder in the dark of night, but I would leave it. If it were not for the coincidence of contemporary solar physics with the sunspots climaxing in 2012. We're in the midst of a 2012 mania, being as spiritually starved as we are, uh, and subject to s such a terrible world around us, we look for explanations. And it's what motivated me to talk a little bit more about the scientific side of some of these explanations. When you look at the totality of the evidence from coming from different ages, different times, periods, and different uh, sources, including scientific, that seem to pretend that something pretty important may be happening or around the year 2012, then I think it's time that we pay uh, serious attention to this. Modern man perceives time as a linear progression with a fixed past, present, and future. The Maya, on the other hand, understood time as something more fluid, and they believed that periods of time would be repeated through a series of world ages. The Maya were far from unique in their understanding of time as repeating cycles. In fact, many cultures around the world have had similar ideas about world ages, with highs and lows, beginnings and endings, apocalypse and renewal. When my book came out in 1998, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, it, it sort of uh, begged the question of whether or not these profound insights of the Maya were known to other world traditions. And so I, I took the whole galactic alignment thesis on a world tour and looked at other traditions. Basically, it does seem that the astronomical cycles and the galactic alignment information is deeply encoded in Western traditions. Mythologies, legends everywhere from the Asia to Americas to Europe to Africa talk about periods of a catastrophic dissolution of advanced civilizations, of civilizations in general. A lot of indigenous cultures around the world have a kind of coherent understanding of what this time means. So the Hopi 
in Arizona talk about this as being the transition from the fourth world to the fifth world, according to their oral prophecies. And then the classical Mayan civilization, they put forth the idea that uh, 2012 is the end of a great cycle. So you can look at Mithraism, you can look at Egypt, you can look at Islamic astrology uh, with the doctrine of the lunar nodes. It almost seems like this galactic alignment information is a very ancient idea. It's really hard to, to look at any ancient mythological system without realizing that they thought in cyclical terms, not in linear terms. So literally, as we would put it today, what goes around comes around. My interest was, could there have been a forgotten episode in human history. And I began to find the evidence forcing me to, to look at a period of about 12,000 years ago, or it was the end of the last ice age. And much in the mythology seemed to suggest that the cataclysm that occurred then in some way was going to come back. And so I found that my quest was not only for the beginning of human civilization, but also for the the end of human civilization and that the ancients seem to be passing down some kind of warning, perhaps taking into account that human civilization would change greatly, that cultures would change, that languages would be lost, looking for a universal system of communication. And it seemed to me that they looked to the heavens for that system uh, because the stars will always be above us and have always been above us. And if it's possible to encode your message by using the changing patterns of the stars, then you might hope that at some distant date someone else might be able to, to read that message. And uh, this is when I came across the, uh, the ancient Maya. The Maya were avid stargazers and appear to have inherited a body of astronomical knowledge from the Olmecs before them. And so it's in the Olmec monuments that we get the first hint of a of a calendar system, and that calendar system is perfected into a fine-tuned device by the ancient Maya. And like so much of ancient thought, it is cyclical in nature that they are repeating periods of history just over 5,000 years in, in, in length. And it's just a fact that the latest cycle of the Maya calendar uh, begins somewhere before 3000 BC and culminates on the 21st of December uh, 2012. For the Maya, the idea that what was there before is lost and then returns would have made perfect sense. And um, it's this sense of a cyclical cataclysm linked to a cyclical rebirth that I found most eerie, really, and, and spooky in the, in the Mayan tradition. The Mayans were extraordinary astronomers. They were able to foretell uh, heavenly phenomena uh, centuries into the future. What is crucial is the position of our sun against the background of the stars at the winter solstice, the 21st of December. And what we find is that the sun is rising against the background of the dead center of the Milky Way in our time. And the Maya knew this, and uh, they knew that people would be able to observe it. And they're saying, this is a very important moment. Take account of this. Realize that you live in a time of change and a time of transition. The prophecies of the Maya are shared by other ancient American cultures, including the Hopi and the Inca. Psychologist and author Alberto Violdo has spent many years with the Peruvian elders of the Andes and has been able to bring back their warning of a catastrophic time for humanity but also the possibility of a new golden age. Humans have become a parasite on this planet. I mean, we are committing matricide. We're killing our mother who supports us. The Earth is designed to support a population of under a billion people riding bicycles to work, not seven billion driving SUVs. So the prophecies speak about this time of a culling of humanity, of a harvesting of souls and the, of a decimation of large parts of the human race and the beginning of a millennium of gold, of tremendous opportunity. They're very optimistic. They're very hopeful for the planet. They're not that optimistic for humanity at large.
I had a shaman tell me one time, Alberto, we're going to miss our white brother. So they, they speak about a correction and a bringing back of balance to the earth. The way that this was announced was with the wrath of our father, the sun. They speak about the drying of the high mountain lagoons, the melting of the glaciers. This was to be the beginning of an apocalyptic era. But the prophecy spoke that the world would be set right again with the new planetary alignment that would take place. 1221-12 prediction of the, of the Mayan calendar is predicated on the assumption that the solar system travels around the galaxy in a, in a predictable path. And that on that particular date, we will eclipse the center of the galaxy. There will be the Earth, here's the Sun, here's the center of the Milky Way. We'll be cut off from a direct connection to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And we will therefore be deprived of a certain energetic sustenance that we, that we, we require for, for continuing to live as, as we have. What could that mean? The, the best description was given me, and, and I, I did go down to Guatemala and spend some time with Mayan shamans, and they related it to, to when you lose power in your house, for some appliances and some functions, there's no problem. When the power comes back on, the lights go back on. But there's certain things, the, the VCR clock and the microwave, that are thrown out of kilter, even for being cut off from that, that sustenance for, for just a second. And that is their, their physical explanation for the danger of this eclipse. The timing of it is, means that all of the heavens will be aligned behind us to enable us to bring forth a new time into the planet, a time of possibility, of opportunity, of healing. I attended the most recent reading of the prophecy in 1998, where they were taking the pulse of the planet to see where we were within the, the division that had been received by the ancient ones. And in that reading of the prophecy, they said that the upheaval and the turmoil was to be far greater than had been anticipated. With the possibility of cascading crises, not a single crisis, but two or three that would cascade off each other, bringing about dramatic corrections in the Earth's climate, making parts of the planet inhospitable and uninhabitable. I think that there is a very real possibility that around 2012 we'll see a shifting of the paradigm and more people will be coming aware of who we are, where we came from, our place in the universe. And then that would pretty much coincide with the mind prediction that we'll be into a new age. None of the ancient cultures that were able to calculate cycles of time with such incredible precision had the powerful telescopes and computers available to modern day astronomers. Instead, they used naked eye observations of the stars above over multiple lifetimes to record and chart changes in the heavens and eventually to plot full cycles of time. The precession of the equinoxes is the astronomical process that, uh, that underlies the, the, the Mayan calendar and, and all ancient systems of cyclical time. Uh, and perhaps I should just say a word about what the precession of the equinoxes is. Precession fundamentally is an observation of, of the heavens and an observation that at certain seasons of the year, particular markers, the, the equinoxes and the solstices, if you look at the background of stars behind the sun, you'll find that that background is very, very slowly changing. Uh, and it's changing at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Uh, and the view of um, mainstream astronomers as to why this is happening is they, ha they hypothesize, they have not proved, that there is a cyclical wobble on the axis of the Earth, rather like the wobble of a top that has been spinning fast, but, but its spin has begun to decay, and, and the, the, the poles of the top begin to make a great circle. Uh, and this is what they believe is happening with the Earth. Uh, now, because the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars, 
changes in orientation of that viewing platform will cause changes in the observed appearance and positions of the stars in the sky at particular times of year. Um, and, and because it's a circular wobble, uh, the whole thing is a cycle and in fact unfolds over a vast span of time. 25,920 years takes you back from the starting position of the clock back fully around the clock to the same position again. So the constellation that is rising behind the sun today in our time and for a period of roughly 2,000 years, which we're just entering into the age of Aquarius when the constellation of Aquarius houses the sun, it will be 26,000 years, 25,920 years before that constellation again rises behind the sun. Ancient astrology in the Western world recognizes that there is this great cycle caused by the wobble of the Earth on its axis, and one complete wobble is 26,000 years. In the Greco-Hellenistic period, there were astrological ideas about how the sun shifts through the 12 signs of the zodiac. So you could divide the 26,000 year period into 12 periods, or 12 ages, or chapters. And this idea is a, is a fairly profound idea. It's, it's referred to as the World Age Doctrine. We can notice that in the Old Testament period there was an obsession with the age of Aries and symbolism around the Lamb. And at the dawn of the Christian period there became an obsession with uh, fish symbolism. And that would indicate our shift into the age of Pisces. Now in the Western astrological tradition we are about to uh, move out of the sign of Pisces. So there's great talk about the shifting of the age right now. We're basically at the cusp of the age of Aquarius. So this astrological doctrine has to do with our changing angular orientation to the larger, uh, the larger cosmos. The belief of many ancient cultures around the world that the precession of the equinoxes maps out changes in cycles of human consciousness has led some researchers to believe that the ancients may have understood the causes and effects of precession in a markedly different way than the generally accepted wobble theory presented by modern scientists. Walter Cruttenden of the Binary Research Institute looked back to the mythology of many of these cultures and posits a very different understanding of precession. Our research has focused on why are so many ancient cultures fascinated with this obtuse thing called precession of the equinox when it takes one uh, a full lifetime just to notice that the stars have moved one degree? There's 200 uh, plus myths that talk about this movement of the stars causes some change in the history of the Earth. And it just seemed that if it is only what modern scholars say it is, just a simple uh, wobbling of the Earth, that it shouldn't be related to any change in history or consciousness. And so we really dug into the Vedic teachings about precession, which, which give us a whole different meaning. We believe that the Earth moving with the Sun, the whole solar system going around another star, we believe is the cause of why we see this procession of the 12 constellations of the zodiac. Cruttenden's Binary Research Institute proposes that our solar system is in fact part of a binary star system, where our Sun is locked in a never-ending cosmic tango with a second Sun each revolving around the other in repeating elliptical orbits lasting 24,000 years. We know that all orbits uh, conform to Kepler's laws. They move in, in the great ellipses rather than circles. And that means the bodies speed up when the two masses get closer to each other, when the gravitation is stronger, and then they slow down when they get farther away from each other. So if precession is the observable of a solar system in motion around another star, it too would have to obey Kepler's laws and speed up and slow down. Now we have really, really good scientific data for the last hundred years, going back to at least the great Simon Newcomb, the number one astronomer in the US, the year 1900. And he kept precise records of precession 
And notice that it's speeding up every year exponentially. So he actually added an, uh, something called a constant to the precession equation, um, Newcomb's constant, we call it nowadays. And even since then, the precession rate has sped up above the constant rate. But uh, we've taken the Vedic view that it's caused by an orbit. That orbit is 24,000 years, and therefore, if precession actually measures 26, we must be in the slow part of the orbit, far from the other star right now. And so we plotted uh, on a curve, what should the precession rate be over this last you know, 100 years, and we came out with the exact curve that we see historically. And from that, we're able to predict that the precession rate will continue to accelerate year after year after year until we reach a periapsis. Periapsis is the point in their elliptical orbit where our sun and its twin are closest together, marking a golden age here on Earth. For now, however, Cruttenden's theory remains a controversial attempt to explain the universal ancient beliefs and cycles of time being dictated by our progression through the signs of the zodiac that comprise the procession of the equinoxes. Regardless of what causes the process, the fact is that the process uh, occurs. Uh, and it is just possible uh, to become aware of it in, in, in one or two human lifetimes. But it seems that past down to us from deep antiquity uh, and the Maya were one of the vehicles or channels to pass this knowledge down was a knowledge of precession of the equinoxes and a very accurate knowledge of the rate at which it unfolds, I would say, a, a knowledge of a scientific level of accuracy and that this is encoded and expressed in ancient myths all around the world and is specifically encoded and uh, expressed in the, in, in the Mayan calendar. So, if there was a golden age in the past, then the ancient system of ideas would suggest that a full cycle of precession, a full cycle of almost 26,000 years, uh, would bring us back to that golden age again. And they always saw a correspondence between sky and ground, so that uh, what happens on Earth is connected to what happens uh, in the heavens. And yes, what goes around comes around. Uh, and we are going through a great cycle of time and we find ourselves placed in a particular position on that cycle of time which in the Mayan system is very near the end of a whole age of the world and the beginning of the next. I think what's interesting is this is 26,000 year period can get neatly broken down into periods about 2,000 years long, in fact make it 2,200 to be exact which marked the passage of the vernal equinox, place of the sun in the vernal equinox, through successive constellations of the zodiac. 2,200 times 12 is about equal to the cycle of precession. And this has led many, many people to assume, with little evidence, that world ages, which are a Judeo-Christian phenomenon, connote divisions of the cycle of the procession of the equinoxes. So we all have heard of the age of Aquarius. Of course, that doesn't happen until 2700 AD. Uh, be that as it may, uh, the sun is about to enter Aquarius in some hundreds of years. Uh, and according to the Judeo-Christian myth, this is a world-changing phenomenon. So one could say that the ages of man are star-fixed, according to this philosophy. That's the connection if it be one, between precession and cycles of renovation. Well, the modern astronomical understanding of precession is, uh, is pretty straightforward. You know, it's kind of a mechanical understanding of how it works and how it uh, affects the, uh, the position of the sun on the equinox or the solstice. It shifts through the zodiac signs and, and so on. I think that there's uh, it's kind of a literal way to interpret what precession is. But there's also a metaphorical or a symbolic understanding that gets more into how human beings are affected, perhaps, how the planet is affected by the, by the processional changes. We might envision that over this great 26,000 year period, there's seasons in the same way that the year cycle has seasons. So there's, you know, summer, fall, winter, spring. 
And I think this is kind of an insight into this larger cycle and how it actually does affect uh, Earth phenomenon, including life on Earth. Cultures all around the world believed that this great year, this cycle, this one eon was broken into seasons, just like our yearly motion. You know, we have spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, they broke it into the easiest ones to understand are the Greek terms, the iron, bronze, silver, and golden age. That's sort of equivalent to summer in terms of consciousness, and then you uh, go back down again. And each of these ages has different characteristics. And the, the Vedic uh, teachers would tell us that we're, we're just coming out of the Kali Yuga, very early into the Dwapara Yuga, which is equivalent of iron to bronze. And we're beginning to realize that we're no longer just physical bodies on a hard physical earth, that we are energy and everything's made of energy. And Consciousness keeps growing. Uh, we use more and more of our consciousness. We live longer and longer. Things become seemingly transparent to us, not because matter changes, but because we just see the potential and possibility in everything. If you have a culture that observes the sky, for whatever reason, religious or scientific, they're bound to notice over two or three generations that the position of stars change. So the awareness of precession is almost certainly known by all ancient cultures. They, they saw it. Now, okay, they could work out the cycle. Let's say they could. But they don't know how the stars change because it's not only their position that change, it's their tilt. So Orion would, would tilt and then retilt back and tilt. Well, again, uh, they, it was observable. And they could work out the rate, and they found out it was also 26,000 years. And it appears to me that there came a moment when they thought they understood what they called the cosmic law. And then they followed it with the monuments, the alignments, the temples, the rituals. In addition to a simple knowledge of procession among the ancients, uh, there seems to be a very, very deep insight into how procession is related to changes on this planet that goes beyond what modern science is willing to acknowledge. When a people like that, uh, who have created a calendar system of mind-boggling complexity and accuracy, uh, tell us that some great change is going to take place in our time, and that it is a change from which humanity will emerge utterly different, um, we need to take them seriously. We can't just dismiss that as the ravings of some primitive tribal culture. And there's a tendency to do that in modern society because we regard every culture before our own uh, as, as primitive. Um, we have to listen to what they have to say. One thought that has often occurred to me since the Maya were such avid stargazers and were founding their star observations on a, a tradition that went back way before them, we just don't know how far back is that they may perhaps have known something that we don't know. When the Maya speak directly and specifically of a cataclysmic end, a gigantic flood, an overthrow of the world as we know it now, I don't think we should rule out the possibility that they may be speaking of real physical events which caused them to want to draw particular attention to, to this date in our calendar, 21st of December 2012. There were floods and hurricanes in the Maya area and the idea of a watery ending to the world. Pictured on page 74 of the Dresden Codex. Last page. Water gushing out of the mountain to the sky. These were real experiences uh, and you have it in the Enuma Elish, which is the Sumerian creation myth. Uh, it is in world mythology because the world is destroyed and it is recreated. And we take these marvelous stories of destruction of the world and recreation and then we bring them into a macroscopic kind of focus by imagining it's the whole world that's going to end. And yes, my friends, it will end. <laughs> There's no question there will be an end of the world. 
you know, study these creation myths and you'll see they're there for a good reason. I mean, people did experience the destruction of their world and, and they did rebuild it. And it happened before and it'll happen again. Uh, unless, uh, I mean, I mean, the way to avoid it in New Orleans is to build better floodgates. And so, see, so it's participatory, isn't it? You, you can make it happen, but you have to work for it. You can't just lay back and do nothing. You've got to be a participant in your cosmology. Unprecedented activity on the sun and increasingly frequent natural disasters on Earth have led some scientists to predict an ominous climax in or about the year 2012. Author Lawrence Joseph has single-mindedly forged an understanding of the scientific data and the perils we may be facing. Solar storms will climax in 2012 and the, the global satellite system is therefore at risk. Let's examine what the global satellite system means to us. Telecommunications, funds transfers, and military, climate, everything bounces off a satellite. The fact of the matter is that a lot of these satellites are not quote unquote hardened sufficiently against increased solar output. Moreover, I found out that a lot of our military uh, communications have been, for reasons of budget and, and I'm not sure why else, have been fobbed off onto commercial satellites which are not hardened. So a lot of the basic military security that we rely on in, in, in the satellite system is open to solar attack. Now what does that mean, solar attack? Uh, the, it's not that the sun doesn't like us and is after us. There's no paranoia in this. It's simply that when the sun has storms, it shoots out billion ton blasts of protons and other radiation. Most of it goes off in other directions, but a certain percentage of it will hit the Earth, just, just the law of averages. Recently, we have found strange occurrences. Usually it takes about two to three days for a coronal mass ejection, a CME, which is the term for this, this blast, to travel from the sun to the Earth. But in January 2005, there was one that made it in 30 minutes. Unless Einstein was seriously mistaken, if that thing cut another 22 minutes off of its uh, travel time, went down to eight minutes, would be the speed of light, we would be completely obliterated. California-sized cracks are opening up in the Earth's magnetic field. And when the crack opens up, the magnetic field is, is our shield against these, these coronal mass ejections, our shield against solar radiation. And when the crack opens up, our shields are down, Scotty. Not all scientists agree with Joseph's findings. Colgate University professor of astronomy and anthropology, Anthony Avini, is skeptical that external forces are creating most of the changes we are experiencing on Earth. If uh, a stream of solar particles can cause a radio fade out, it can also affect satellite communications. But I don't think that it's going to have any large-scale geophysical effect on the Earth. And I suppose you could, if you really want to push it, you could connect it with weather. But we have to remember that the bulk of the effect that produces hurricanes, tornadoes, is entirely encased within the earth. It's got more to do, a lot more to do with rotation and the circulation of air than it does with these outside effects, but I would admit that they could have a meteorological effect. There are a number of theories as to why the, the sun is acting up in, in, in this way and, and, and why in 2012 it, it will be the next climax of such activity. I had become familiar with the work of a Dr. Alexei Dmitriev who's a Russian geophysicist who, for about a decade now, has contended, in a nutshell, that our entire solar system is moving into an interstellar energy cloud. And this cloud is responsible for exciting the atmospheres of the planets, including the Earth, and particularly the Sun. And the reason why the sunspots are growing stronger and more frequent is because we're moving into this cloud. He based his, his findings on you know, a lifetime of esteemed work, and particularly his team had meticulously analyzed Voyager satellite data. And we're seeing things we've never seen before. And he believes and has devoted a good 15 years 
to proving that we are now, we've entered an, an energy cloud that we will remain in probably, he guesses and he cannot verify this, for about 3,000 years. And this energy cloud is simply shaking things up. And it's having its strongest direct effect on the sun, which in turn has effect on all the other planets, including the Earth. So that's the most well-researched theory as to why the sun is behaving strangely. Most scientists, I think, will, will, will give you that it may well be the most active the sun has been since the end of the last ice age. So we can't really infer reliably from earthbound data, which is all we have, how the sun acted before the end of the last ice age. But it appears that since then, this is the wildest it has been. Virtually everyone will agree that 2012 is the next year of solar climax. The coming solar maximum in 2012 is not the only cause for concern. Scientists have noticed a weakening of the Earth's magnetic field and a shifting of the poles. Some even suggesting that the North and South Poles could literally reverse places with each other. I think uh, viewers have probably read about the changing in the magnetic poles of the Earth, the magnetic reversal. Uh, it overturns very slowly may take a few hundreds of years to make a complete overturn uh, and it's probably the case that we're in an overturn now a beginning of an overturn because the position of the magnetic pole uh, has migrated some few hundred miles in the last few decades so it is beginning to overturn now the real question is what is the effect of the overturn uh, of the magnetic field on earth phenomena there could be a reduction in the shielding effect this could have some consequence. I don't think it's known whether the consequence will be calamitous, disastrous. It certainly won't be sudden. But probably some meteorological change will take place. This planet has at, has at its heart a, a, a ball of molten iron um, with, an, with enormous mass and, and weight, which is also spinning inside the Earth itself. Is it possible that there is some interruption in this spin, perhaps to do with magnetism, perhaps to do with solar magnetism, which, which literally ca capsizes the Earth? I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out entirely, and, and there's much that's come down to us from the past that suggests that. Lots has been said about a potential pole shift. It seems clear that the poles are beginning to move at, at rates that have not ever been measured before. Whether or not this is the beginning of an actual pole shift or, or more, how long this all will take, I don't think anybody can say. But of a more immediate concern is 2012, five years from now. The consequences for us here are gonna be greater. For the satellite system, for our health in terms of skin cancers and, and cataracts in the eyes and, and a host of, 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 of health-related issues, and perhaps, again, as I, as I mentioned, there's a growing body of evidence that earthquakes and volcanoes, and of course hurricanes, are related to solar, solar input. We have, to get, we have to learn it fast. At least we have to get a sense of the magnitude of this connection and, and what we might be able to do to minimize these effects. I think the thing that fascinates me most about 2012 is just the totality of the information. I mean, not only do we have ancient prophecies and of course the Mayan calendar, and it all seems to culminate in 2012. Um, we all know, of course, that there's earth changes taking place, polar caps melting and uh, global warming all over the place. What most people don't realize is this is a solar system-wide phenomena. The polar caps on Mars are melting. The outer planets are more luminescent, meaning they're heating up. So something is definitely happening. If a pole shift occurred within the next few years, it would disrupt civilization as we know it. Would it, would, would it be the end of life as we know it? No. But it would be such a major change that it would mark the end of an era that we probably all had assumed was eternal. Whether or not the changes on Earth and in our solar system are evidence of a physical, real-world climax in 2012, many believe that there is a coming shift in human consciousness that was the true message of the Maya and to which we must pay due respect and consider acting upon.
I tend towards the metaphorical interpretation here. I think that if we're due for any kind of pole shift, it should be a pole shift in our collective consciousness. In other words, we have to steer clear of that, that pole that, that wants us to keep living in a world of dualism, you know, to be fixated to that, that, uh, that mode of culture that seeks to dominate other cultures around the world and instead shift our minds to emphasize a partnership society. The work of John Major Jenkins, very important. Uh, it's had a huge influence on my thinking about the ancient Maya. I think he's really made highly significant breakthroughs uh, in understanding what was going on with the ancient Maya and, and, and what event in the heavens they were able to predict thousands of years ago that would occur in our time and our time only. appear to have been able to do that thousands of years ago to cast forward to, to a time which marks the end of the calendar system when the sun appears in the dead center of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, I take this as a marker. They knew that that would happen. It's easy to read into it a cataclysmic end of the world uh, in, in, in our age. But John Major Jenkins' work has been particularly helpful in showing that it's easy to read another possibility into it too, uh, which is yes, the world age will come to an end. Everything that has been built for the last 5,000 years will be up for grabs. Uh, we may not count on things remaining the same as they have done throughout our lifetimes. Things are going to change. But also uh, that this is a rebirth, not a simple destruction. And that in a way it may be, it may be necessary to sweep away the old before something new, something more positive, something more hopeful, a new guiding spirit for the next 5,000 years uh, emerges. And uh, John has shown the, the astronomical correlates of this and has shown how the sun effectively seems to emerge from the cosmic womb, from the womb of the Milky Way, speaking of, speaking of rebirth. And so he draws from this uh, a hopeful message, which I, which I happen to share with him, that, that uh, this is perhaps the best way to interpret the Mayan prophecy, that uh, we live in a time uh, when things will never be the same again and it is we who will preside uh, over that change and it is our own choices and what we do with our own consciousness uh, that will govern whether that change is for good or for evil. The Maya calendars speak for an insight into time that is somewhat counterintuitive to uh, Western linear time. Uh, for the Maya, it's cyclic, but it's not only uh, an insight into the cyclic nature of time, but it's a vision of time and cycles as a breathing out and a breathing in. You know, moving out of connection to our true selves and then moving back into relationship with our true selves. The long count cycle, which we um, understand as one of, uh, one of the grand cycles of, of the Maya, it was uh, conceived of as um, uh, a creation moment and, uh, and a completion of a, of a, of a cycle. These um, uh, eras, as we may, might well call them, uh, lasted uh, a grand number of years, uh, 5,125 uh, years. This great um, tally of, uh, of years uh, comes to its completion uh, in December of 2012. Um, curiously enough, it, it, it also uh, coincides with the winter solstice. Um, this we thought uh, was, was quite, uh, quite prof um, interesting and profound um, and probably not uh, accidental in any way for the, for the ancient Maya, uh, being that these two uh, very important um, solar stations um, bracketed the creation to uh, completion. The Maya calendars also encode an insight into the interwoven nature of reality, what we might call a, a, a fractal model or, or a quantum model of reality. We see this most clearly in the 260-day calendar, the Zolkin. This is the core building block of all the Maya calendar systems. 
It consists of uh, 13 numbers combined with 20 day signs, so 13 times 20 equals 260. 260 is a key number for the Maya because it corresponds to the human gestation period. So there's this nine month process of human unfolding that we all share. This is the philosophy behind the Maya calendar. Time unfolds like a flower, and it's unfolding the inner essence, consciousness, out of the earth matrix, you might say. Another use for the 260-day calendar is that it corresponds to the interval between planting and harvesting of corn in the highlands. So that's an agricultural metaphor. Most incredibly, the 260-day calendar is used as a key in the Maya almanacs. The Maya almanacs are calendars that schedule the appearance of Venus and Mercury and Mars. So there's this, this very, very important astronomical reference in the 260-day Zolkin calendar as well. What we see in all this is the use of 260 as a key to different dimensions in human experience. Uh, it's basically uniting the cycles in the heavens and the cycles here on Earth, including cycles that human beings experience. So it's an insight into that paradigm of as above, so below. The microcosm reflects the macrocosm. We do the same thing in our cultures. We celebrate uh, yearly cycles, we celebrate uh, um, century cycles, and oftentimes these uh, cyclical changes come uh, with a, a deeper um, foreboding, ominous uh, um, feeling to them. Uh, one is not certain, you know, uh, whether uh, the universe can be reordered and restructured. We see this uh, happening in, in many of the, the ancient uh, um, festivals, uh, such as the, the new fire ceremony, for instance. When Tolkien and Hob counts came to the, the completion of a cycle, all fires were to be put out uh, throughout the uh, territory and a new fire initiated. Uh, these were moments of darkness. It's uh, the darkness representing this uh, uh, primordial origin, once again. Uh, the new fire uh, is the creation of the hearth once again. Um, we, we see these as, as very symbolic and very powerful moments of uh, recycling and, and renewal. The grand cycle should fall within the same parameters. And so on the closure of the grandest of the cycles of all, this should also be a moment of closure, but also of renewal. There are still day keepers that are following in an unbroken way, the ancient Zolkin calendar. However, there's another calendar, the Long Count, that basically fell into disuse over eight centuries ago. This is the calendar that gives us the 2012 end date. In the Long Count calendar, there are uh, cycles, and the largest cycle is a period of 13 Bakhtuns, which is 5,125 years. This 13 Bakhtun cycle was conceived of by the Maya as one world age. So it's a key to understanding the Maya doctrine of the world ages that we find in the creation mythology. And scholars now know how to correlate the Maya calendar with our own calendar. We know that the 13 Bakhtun cycle end date falls precisely on December 21st of 2012. The long count develops to a much greater degree in certain sites, uh, a lesser degree in others. Uh, some sites will, will um, only utilize the 260-day count, um, and most of their hieroglyphic inscriptions do not uh, incorporate the long count. Other sites will develop even more complex uh, cycles, such as the 819-day cycle that Palenque develops. The calendar is manipulated and, and, and utilized in different sites uh, to a, a different degree. But we can say uh, that throughout the Maya world, um, that system was um, prevalent uh, during the middle to late classic period, it being abandoned um, shortly after the uh, decline and uh, uh, subsequent abandonment of some of these great sites. Why did the Maya pick 2012? to end this vast cycle of 13 Bakhtuns. For the Maya, the important thing always happens at the end of the cycle. Uh, so at the end of the cycle, you have this galactic alignment 
Now, my approach to the galactic alignment has been to look into the Maya traditions and try to understand how the Maya encoded this galactic alignment into their core traditions, such as the Maya creation mythology, the ball game symbolism, other Maya traditions, such as king making ceremonies. And what I found is that the December solstice sun and the Milky Way and these different features, these astronomical features that are involved in the galactic alignment. Uh, for example, there's, a, there's a, a feature called the dark rift, the great cleft in the Milky Way. This is precisely where the December solstice sun is going to be converging with the Milky Way at the dark rift. These astronomical features are front and center in the Maya creation mythology. A long time already we've we've been aware of the fundamental aspects of the of the uh, epigraphy and, and the writing system of the Maya involved um, calculations of time um, and uh, those um, were determined to be related to astronomical cycles so we we understand from a very early time that uh, astronomy was very influential in the uh, creation of, a, of an ideology One of the ways that the ancient Maya encoded their understanding of cosmology, including procession and including the galactic alignment, was through mystery play. Like, for example, the mystery play of the Maya creation myth. It has to do with the ball game and how the hero twins must kick the ball into the goal ring. Well, the Maya populace could come to see the mystery play and they would observe that and you, you could just sort of understand it in the, in the literal way of the play unfolding before you, but to those who are sensitive to the deeper esoteric or symbolic meaning in the mystery play, they would know that the game ball is a symbol for the December solstice sun, and when the hero twins are trying to kick the game ball into the goal ring, the goal ring being the dark rift in the Milky Way, the whole mystery play and the ball game is a story that encodes the galactic alignment process. A number of hieroglyphic inscriptions um, situated uh, throughout the Maya world tell us that the concept of uh, creation was a pan-Maya um, phenomenon. Each site, it seems, had their own uh, version of that mythology. In this way, we see that um, there is a, 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 a kind of uniqueness to each site, um, but still maintain a very strict adherence to a, uh, a philosophy that was universal. And so uh, we can say that uh, Palenque, for example, developed uh, a, a complex uh, relationship to those ancestral deities and that moment of creation uh, and expressed it in, in, a, in a beautiful way, um, a way that was unique to Palenque. The Maya have a concept of a sacred tree, or a crossroads. It's basically the cross formed by the Milky Way, where it crosses over the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path followed by the sun, moon, and planets. So in the sky, you have this cross. Uh, it's also referred to as the sacred tree. And it manifests in Mayan symbolism and iconography. For example, uh, at the classic period site of Palenque, the great ruler Pakal was buried and his sarcophagus lid has a very famous carving on it and it depicts him falling into the underworld at death. He's basically entering the dark rift. So the dark rift is at the center of the sacred tree formed by the Milky Way and the ecliptic and it's right there on his sarcophagus lid. Uh, the Maya kings were shamanistic. Pakal is seen to be a kind of visionary shaman figure and the shaman had to journey into the cosmic center. That's where he was able to retrieve the sacred power of rulership. So that image of Pakal on his sarcophagus lid is not simply an after death image, it's an image of the shaman journeying into the cosmic center, into the dark rift, to retrieve the uh, sacred otherworldly powers of rulership.
One of the most important uh, temples here in Palenque is the Temple of Inscriptions. That's the tomb of the most important king of the city, Pakal. And it's one of the most beautiful uh, temples in all the Maya world. Going hand in hand with visionary shamanism, which was a, a sort of a, a, a journeying into the outer cosmos in a, uh, a spiritual sense, was an interest in the actual astronomical sky. At Palenque, near the palace, the famous square palace building, in that complex of buildings, there are several very interesting areas. They're like courtyards. They're sort of like rectangular areas that are surrounded by walls about three feet high. It's now believed that these were once filled with water. And Mayan astronomers and visionary calendar priests would sit around this and at night the sky would be reflected in the still calm water of these rectangular pools. This is how the Maya did their stargazing. It's very very interesting because instead of looking up at the sky they were looking down at the sky reflected in the water. Very very interesting because for the Maya the sky at night was envisioned as the underworld flipped upside down. So all the stars and the planets that are moving around and doing alignments in the sky were actually the activities and movements of the underworld deities. This is a really interesting idea because it, uh, uh, it shows how apparent opposites like sky and underworld are integrated in the Mayan concept. While the majority of Mayan scholars have focused on classic sites in Mexico, Guatemala, Belize and Honduras, John Major Jenkins has devoted much of his research to the once obscure site of Izapa in southern Mexico. There he found a great number of stelae, stone monuments, depicting the mythology and cosmology of the Maya. The early Maya site called Izapa the site that invented this long count calendar that gives us the 2012 end date is really a key to understanding how the early Maya thought of 2012 and the galactic alignment. The monuments of Azapa were found in the 1950s and 60s as they were left some 1800 years ago, so they're in situ. They're still oriented to certain horizons in certain ways. One of the key horizon alignments at Azapa is the December solstice sunrise. So we start to see how Izapa is a site that helps us understand the galactic alignment in 2012. For example, Stila 11 from Izapa portrays Wan Hunapu, the father of the hero twins. He represents the December solstice sun. And he's, he's emerging from the upturned mouth of a frog. That's the rebirth place. The, the mouth of the frog or the mouth of the snake, that represents the dark rift. His arms are outstretched, and, the, and his, his, it's basically a period measuring gesture. He's basically measuring a cycle of time. So what this is saying is that at the end of the cycle, the December solstice sun is lined up with the dark rift, and this carving, Stila 11, points right to the rising December solstice sun. That's just one example of how Izapa encodes information about 2012. That you might refer to that as the astronomical reference at the site. But there's also a prophecy and a spiritual teaching that's encoded on the monuments that has to do with the Mayan belief about what is going to happen, you might say. While John Major Jenkins' research has gained widespread acclaim as a breakthrough in understanding the Mayan calendar system and its message for us, the academic mainstream have yet to fully embrace his insights. It is true that when the sun is at the winter solstice it more or less lines up in the direction of the constellation of Sagittarius which is close to what we would call the center of the Milky Way galaxy which was not determined until even later I stress this because one wants to argue about precision here uh, I could say in a very general way that the winter solstice sun comes through that general area of Sagittarius, whether it's conceived of as the center of a galaxy or not, somewhere between the years 1900 and 2150. 
to dare to pinpoint it any more accurately is to suggest that the Maya did. And I'll go back to what I always go back to. I've got to see the evidence. And I've got to see something more than just some interpretation of an iconography on a stela. I've got to see it in the codices. I've got to see it in writing. I've got to see the numbers. If the astronomers cared about that, they would have backed it up with numbers. Um, so one does have such an alignment, but in the most, in the crudest possible sense you can imagine it. Whether or not the Maya accurately predicted the relative location of the Earth, the Sun, and the center of the Milky Way galaxy on December 21, 2012, the fabled galactic alignment, their observation of the heavens above directly influenced their worldview below on Earth. The Mayan shamans, or spiritual leaders, used hallucinogenic plants and substances to enter an altered state from which they were able to bring back wisdom and knowledge, enabling them to interpret their heavenly observations. Izapa really was a kind of new world Eleusis. In the old world, Eleusis was a place where seekers were initiated into the sacred mysteries. And at Izapa, initiates, those seeking knowledge, were brought through a process of understanding this new galactic cosmology. And clearly, sacred plants was part of this. We know that ritual mushroom stones were found in the region around Izapa, so we know that there was a kind of mushroom cult going on there. And we also know that dimethyltryptamine is a powerful hallucinogenic that can be harvested from the glands of the bufo toad. And Stela 6 at Azapa, for example, depicts the bufo toad. And it actually shows the, the toad's glands with vision scrolls coming out of the glands. This actually indicates a, a very clear proof that they were aware of the vision producing effects of the gland secretions. So it's very clear that Azapa was an initiatory center that utilized hallucinogenic plants and substances in order to facilitate um, expansion of consciousness so that uh, larger perspectives could be embraced. The Inca, the Hopi, the Mayans were all shamanic cultures and they entered into altered states of awareness in order to access this body of wisdom which is infinite. So to do that they had to step outside of ordinary time which is the opportunity we all have today as we come to the end of time is to step into infinity, to step into this body of ancient wisdom. We can learn from ancient civilizations and so, so I hope I've played some part in reintroducing the wisdom of the ancient world to the modern world and helping people to open their eyes and open their ears and, and hear what the ancients have to say to us and, and more recently also the recognition that um, the shamans of tribal and hunter-gatherer societies around the world with their systems and techniques for contacting the spirit realm directly also have a great deal to teach us so you know I would advocate a kind of reversal of the normal order of things it's not we uh, in our scientific and technological world uh, where everything is rooted and grounded in a material and mechanistic view of the universe. It is not uh, we uh, who may place ourselves above the civilizations of antiquity. We may not say that we are greater than or better than the shaman in uh, a small village in, in, in the Amazon. Those civilizations of antiquity and those tribal shamans today uh, have a huge amount to teach us and uh, we can only recover the better part of ourselves if we are willing to listen to what they have to say. So uh, I suppose that's, that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to say this that came before, uh, this knowledge of the spirit world that shamans still possess today, this is what really matters about us. Let's listen to it. Sacred plants will give you access. They'll give you access to these domains, but that's the easy way. Shamanic training is very rigorous. It demands that you, that you spend time in nature and vision quest and not just increase the serotonin levels in your brain so you can experience the divine for a fleeting moment and then come back into a life that is hell. 
So you have to be willing to pay your dues, to do the work, to um, spend time in nature, to spend time with yourself and not just increase the levels of dopamine or certain brain chemicals that stimulate bliss. The psychedelics have opened the doors for many people in the West, but opening the doors and walking through them are very different things. Ultimately, no one can be sure what 2012 will bring. Cascading crises, climaxing in some sort of apocalyptic event, or advancement into an enlightened era of human existence. However, most researchers who have studied the ancient mythology carefully bring back a message of hope, albeit one that requires us to participate and help bring about a new golden age. I think that the core teachings are, are there and present in the Maya creation myth. And it does relate to the galactic alignment. It relates to this opportunity that we have to reconnect with our uh, true selves, with the unity consciousness, through which we can solve the intractable dilemmas of the world. We have to get back to that unity consciousness and awareness of how we as individuals fit into the whole. This is not a call to annihilate the ego or to annihilate our sense of individuality. It's really a, uh, a call to be aware of our individuality at the same time that we're aware of the larger picture. But it does require that we choose to be actively engaged in the process. It's not something that's going to happen automatically. That's kind of the interpretation of a cop-out or something like that. We really have to understand that uh, we do have a choice, but we can choose to close down in fear and succumb to the forces of limitation that, that seek to keep us limited, keep us stuck to our egos, and, or we can open up in trust and uh, respect for uh, what is possible. For me, um, part of the essential you know, kind of shift in consciousness that we may be undergoing is this kind of integration of uh, empirical, rational, scientific thought and uh, intuitive, uh, shamanic, and mystical knowledge systems. And for me, it's really as those two aspects uh, come together, this next level of human consciousness is, is beginning to be formed and to sort of recognize itself. And that's actually what I see the archetype of Quetzalcoatl also kind of indicating or representing as an archetype. It's the meaning of bird and snake, uh, the feathered serpent. So it's the meeting of he heaven and earth, uh, spirit and matter, uh, or it could be seen as the meeting of the materialist, empirical thrust of Western culture with the esoteric and mystical framework of indigenous cultures and Eastern cultures. So for me, like one thing that's really important that's been happening lately in the last 50 years has been the integration integration of Eastern metaphysical thought into the Western psyche. You know, so like everywhere you go, like every airplane, people are reading Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, you know, Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. I mean, that's Vedanta philosophy re-expressed for the, for the European Western mindset. So people still sort of tend to think of spirituality as a trend in a way, but I don't like the word spirituality very much, but I think it's much closer to being a profound uh, and transformative shift in, in, the, in our psyche. So now I think there's a second stage in that initiatory process going on for the Western psyche, but it's happening on a much more foundational level because so many more people have made those kind of uh, connections and, and have had those kind of experiences and have kind of integrated to a much deeper level. According to the Maya the world, the Maya beliefs, this uh, cycle is the cycle of the death. So probably they, they trace this exact day, December 21, uh, 2012, because this is the time when all the death is going to stop and it's going to start another uh, cycle of rebirth. Peace, but it can represent a lot of things. I'm sure that the, that the world is going, not going to end in that specific day. Another cycle is going to begin. Worrying about some unfounded cataclysm that's going to take place in the year 2012 is not a part of my worldview. I just don't get it. And so I would advise you not to worry. I would advise you not to worry. Invest your time in feeding the homeless, helping the poor, and being green. I mean, invest your time in that. 
not in uh, joining some far out cult where we'll all stand at the top of the North Pole on our heads uh, to wait for the coming. Because I don't think it's going to happen. It ain't going to happen. How's that for being specific? I, I just don't think that there's a moment at 2012 where, like Jehovah's Witnesses, we, the, the psychedelically enlightened few, are going to have to walk civilization down off its bad trip, right? I think that time's already here. So yeah, it is up to us to, to take each other down off the bad trip. It's just that I don't think that's, that's four or five years from now. I think I see it every day. The concept that um, uh, this end date or, um, or completion date of the Mayan calendar uh, has some relevance to the world in a global sense, I think is a fallacious uh, thought um, because this system uh, is a particular system that was developed for and by uh, Maya, for their uh, particular ideology, for their particular uh, place in the world. It would be a mistake to rally around um, a philosophy that has has its place in its history and in, and in its world and appropriate it as something that belongs to um, a, a global sense. As the, we come to the end of the calendar, we're going to be emerging into a millennium of gold, millennium of opportunity, a, a time of living at peace with each other, of, of clean rivers, of clean air. Our challenge today is to embody the prophecies, to become that human after 2012 that I refer to as homo luminous, but that's not guaranteed. We think that we can postpone making the tough choices. Well, the time is today. I'm very much aware of all the prophecies and all the talk and discussion about 2012, but then I also lived through the Russians going to kill us next week in the Cold War and the Harmonic Convergence and Y2K. And uh, I think my first piece of advice to people is uh, don't sell your house and move to the mountains because I think there's every likelihood that in 2013 your bills will still be coming in. There's a difference between East and West that is increasing at exponential speed. I see it every day. I mean, I live in the Middle East and I see it growing every day. It's based on total misunderstanding of each other. And this misunderstanding stems from the way that we have developed our cultures. Uh, we do not use the common denominators anymore. Ultimately, we're all children on this planet. We belong to the same planet. Uh, what we have done is segregate this and, and separated these beliefs through religious orders, through uh, uh, nationalistic orders. We're in dire need for a message. We need, a, we need visionaries who make us see things uh, in the right way. We need to realign ourselves into a form of thing. We need to remove the differences between us. Uh, we need to remove the the, the, the strong religious rifts. We need to remind ourselves that even if we are to have religion, that it springs from the same source, which is ironic because the three major Semitic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are literally from the same source, from the Old Testament. And yet we've slaughtered each other for centuries. Why? Because we've taken that common denominator and isolated it to create different power bases. Somehow we need to realign all this. Is there going to be a cataclysm? Is it bad news for us? Or is it more like, boy, by getting together and, 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 and bringing ourselves together, we can somehow make the world change? It's the latter part that appealed so much to people when they read about the Maya, because the Maya developed a participatory cosmology. It's all about human action and what you must do as a human being to perpetuate the status quo in the universe or to change it. It's up to you. You can do it. And here we sit in the year 2012 approaching, not being able to do a damn thing about the Big Bang or evolution. And that bothers us. We want a cosmology in which we can participate. The Maya had it. 
And so we look to them and say, well, maybe we can learn something from them. And I'm all for it. I mean, I think there, a, I think there will be a positive outcome from the 2012 hype and mania, as I characterized it, uh, because perhaps it'll make us take our cosmology a bit more seriously, look into it a bit more, think a little bit more about collective human consciousness, think a little bit more about what we can do to make the world a better place. Uh, that's a great message. And if that's what comes out of all of this, I'm a happy, I'm a happy camper, as we say. I think we have gone through and are going through the final stages of a very dark age, but I also see glimmers of hope everywhere I look. I see people who are no longer willing to have their thoughts and their consciousness patrolled and controlled by others, uh, who seek direct spiritual contact, who recognize that the established monotheistic religions, whether Judaism, Christianity and Islam, while they might have been instruments of liberation at some time in the past are now primarily instruments of oppression and hold down and suppress the human spirit. And I see everywhere around me people reaching out to bypass that um, monolithic block of established religion and make their own contacts and own connections uh, with, the, with the spirit realm. I do see a new birth of human consciousness underway. And when these things happen, they can sometimes happen very, very fast. So I do not rule out at all the possibility that all of us are going to be looking at the mystery and meaning of life in a very different way uh, very soon. And uh, that date, 21st of December 2012, sticks in my mind uh, as one that is uh, really worthy uh, of, of consideration.